All right, so welcome everybody who has already joined the webinar. Uh, I guess some people are still joining, but um, I think while that's happening, maybe we can address some kind of uh, some like general things about the webinar. Uh, so at first, I saw some of you already wrote some messages in the chat, uh, but just keep in mind, if you just want to you know, talk to others in the chat, then you can actually mark so that you can send the messages to all panelists and attendees rather than just all panelists. Uh, so there's that. Also, kind of like a general uh, like agenda of the webinar is that at the very beginning, I'll give you somewhat of a brief introduction to kind of what it is that we do, uh, what's our current experience uh, with uh, G using GPR on a drone. And then after that, we'll kind of dive into GeoHammer and then I'll just kind of show you where you can get GeoHammer, how to install it, and how do you actually use it to process GPR data. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the plan for today. And I think the total length of the webinar is probably going to be somewhere from uh, half an hour to an hour, depending on, you know, how many questions are you going to have and so forth. Uh, so yeah, I think we can probably then uh, actually get started with everything. Uh, so uh, again, welcome everybody. Maybe some, somebody has joined after that. And yeah, so my name is Christops and I'll be your um, host for the evening, so to say. Uh, so uh, maybe I can tell you first a bit about my my background. So um, yeah, I I'm, have graduated Tallinn University of Technology in integrated engineering, and I have been working with uh, SPH Engineering and with GCS since uh, 2014. I'm currently licensed to fly UAVs up to, to 25 kilograms, and also I have participated in the expedition that we did to Greenland uh, with our GPR system in 2019, where we uh, were searching for the Grumman Duck aircraft, which went missing during uh, World War II. Uh, yeah, one more thing, uh, as already Sabina mentioned in the in the chat. So please, if you have any questions during the webinar, then please do put the questions in the Q and A section. Uh, so Zoom has a separate Q and A section where you can put them. And then either during the webinar or uh, at the end of it, then I can try to answer your questions. And also uh, keep in mind this webinar is being recorded. So later on, you also, if you have registered, then you'll also be able to get the recording of the webinar. And yeah, kind of going back to where I was. Uh, so yeah, about my background. So I have participated in this expedition to Greenland last year. And also I am currently leading customer training sessions uh, for our industrial customers and in other projects as well. Uh, so probably now it makes sense to kind of tell you a bit about our experience with using GPR on uh, on the drone and kind of uh, what, what did we do? What did we develop to uh, make everything work? Uh, so uh, we started experimenting with this, uh, I'd say probably around like three years ago. And uh, so actually it all started with 2018 expedition to Greenland and actually a bit before that. Uh, but so during this expedition, we kind of understood a lot of things and also mentioned them here a bit. Uh, so one of the first things which you get when you're using GPR on the drone is that you're able to get higher survey accuracy and also higher level, higher degree of productivity. So obviously a drone is able to follow a survey line a lot more closer than a person dragging uh, the radar would be. And so also since in this, these cases, this, the GP, GPS data is combined with the GPR data, uh, then essentially you can get a higher level of um, positioning accuracy. And yeah, of course, these kind of surveys, they are also faster and they do have a higher degree of automation. So what you do in these cases is you plan the mission in GCS mission planning software then you launch the drone on the flight and then essentially just wait for the drone to finish the flight. And then, uh, you know, you can already start looking at the data with software such as GeoHammer, which is what we're going to be doing in a moment. Uh, so when we're doing this uh, development, we also realized that there is a need to have this automatic data logging so that the data starts, uh, log that logging is started and stopped when the flight started and stopped. Uh, otherwise, what you might get is that, let's say, the pilot might launch the drone on the flight, and then they uh, might realize that m maybe they forgot to turn on the data logging. Or maybe they did turn it on, but after the flight, they somehow forgot to turn it off. So it can lead to some problems, and also maybe in some cases, you can uh, you can lose the data. Let's say if you already go back to your office, and then you realize that, okay, all the data from this field's, uh, this day's flight is actually lost. Uh, so to prevent cases like this, what we did, we basically made our own onboard computer, which we are now using onboard the drone. It's called the SkyHub computer. And so uh, in this, all the data is stored 
And so also it kind of combines the data coming from the drone's GPS together with the data coming from the uh, GPR. Um, yeah, then uh, one more thing is that there is, of course, a drawback to using GPR on a drone. And we're not really claiming that uh, GPR on a drone should replace conventional GPR methods, but it can be used as an addition to them. So uh, you do actually lose the maximum penetration depth. So if you would compare the maximum penetration depth between different GPR antennas, uh, you would understand that, or you would realize that uh, there's actually about a 2%, sorry, not 2%, but two times loss or 50% loss in maximum penetration depth when you compare using GPR on a drone versus, let's say, dragging GPR on the ground. Uh, but then again, we get to one advantage, which is that it is actually suitable uh, to use GPR on a drone on uneven on or even dangerous terrain. So in many places where you wouldn't really want to send people or where it would be quite complex or dangerous to send uh, you know, human beings, then actually you, you just simply sending a drone with a GPR uh, is, is a lot easier. And of course, you're not risking anybody's life when you're doing these surveys. Uh, one example with this case would be our 2018 expedition to Greenland, uh, where there the drone basically had to fly over over the ice and in many places there can be some ice crevices for example where you know a person could fall in uh, but of course with the drone that's not really an issue because uh, you know it's flying above that obviously uh, so yeah that's one of the advantages and uh, another kind of disadvantage of course when you're using gpr on a drone is that the flight time is somewhat limited so when you're using the gpr on the drone then the survey can last from about 15 to 20 minutes depending on kind of what configuration you're using how heavy is the gpr and so forth uh, but still this can be solved simply by either having multiple battery sets and changing them so our ugcs flight, flight planning software it does support a battery change so you can simply uh, if at some point the battery gets quite low you can fly the drone back change the battery and then you can restart the flight from the last location and also actually another way how to solve this is by simply using a hybrid drone. So there are various companies who are developing this and uh, one of them is Avartek in Finland and they have also developed this hybrid drone uh, which can basically have a flight time of about two hours. And th then this would actually also kind of take away this battery bottleneck. Uh, and yeah, one other thing we did discover uh, is that it is necessary to use true terrain following when you're flying these missions with a drone. Because if you're not using true terrain following, you are flying to normal, uh, let's say, AGL uh, data that you're getting from somewhere. And in many cases, it's not accurate enough. So even if you get this data from some like scientific you know, site that did the research and that now has uh, these data sets available for you, uh, they still might not correspond to the reality, especially in some more harsh locations when there's you know, a lot of snow, a lot of ice, where the conditions there are constantly changing. Uh, so because of this, we did develop uh, kind of the True Trend Following kit. Uh, so basically now we are selling the SkyHub computer together with either a laser or a radar altimeter, which you can put onto your drone. And then essentially the drone can be set to follow the terrain at let's say one meter, two meters. Uh, so yeah, currently these uh, sets are available for DJI M600, M210, as well as uh, Pixhawk based drones. Um, so, yeah, uh, I see there's one question from Lee. Uh, yeah, so what's the maximum underground area or I guess the uh, what's the maximum penetration depth of a GPR? And this does really depend. So it does depend on what antenna you're using. So, for example, uh, if you're using some lower frequency antenna, such as, let's say, the, uh, the Cobra SC-150, then with this antenna, also depending on what soil you're flying over, you can uh, see up to like 10 meter depth. If you're using the RADS Zond uh, radar, for example, the Zond 500, so 500 megahertz central frequency. So this one you can see up to about five meters, but this is in normal soil. In other conditions, such as ice, you're actually able to see a lot deeper. So for example, when we did detect this aircraft in 2018, then this aircraft actually was detected by a GPR, uh, by, the, by the Cobra SC-70. It was detected at a depth of about 100, actually even a bit more than 100 meters. So yeah, it does really depend on uh, firstly what soil you're flying over uh, and what antenna you're using. So those are the you know the the most kind of common points. Yep, I think we can probably then move further. So here uh, I just want to kind of show to you an image of uh, the system, so you would have kind of a bit more uh, something more visual in your mind. 
So this is the DJI M600 drone and under it, this orange, uh, well, inside the orange enclosure is the Zone 500 uh, GPR made by Radsys. And here underneath the drone, this is where you can see our Skyhub or the onboard data logger. And also on this arm that's set over here, you can see the laser altimeter. So basically with this system, you're able to set the drone to follow any terrain at a certain height. So normally, uh, especially with the Zond radars, you want to fly as low as possible. Uh, so uh, yeah, in, uh, in, no in normal situations, you would fly so that the antenna is, let's say about 0 0.6 meters above the ground. Uh, that would be like the minimum, uh, minimum altitude. Uh, and yeah, of course, yeah, the closer you go, the better. With some antennas, they do have the dead zone, so you have to fly a bit higher. But yeah, so this is the system we are using, which we are selling. So in case you are interested in this, then, you know, just reach out to us and then uh, we can talk about the specifics. But yeah, if we can come back to the, uh, the point uh, of this, uh, this webinar, then this is our GeoHammer software. So I think first I'll explain a bit about what is GeoHammer and then we'll kind of dive into how to install it and how to use it. So what is GeoHammer? GeoHammer is essentially a simple tool which you can use to quickly assess and pre-process GPR data. And I'll, I'll tell a bit more about what, what we mean by this exactly. But one other important point is that we have made GeoHammer free to use and open source. So it's available on GitHub. You can go to GitHub right now. You can download it and uh, play around with it either together as I'm doing that or you can do so after the webinar. Uh, this is the interface of the GeoHammer. So this is just a screenshot, but in a moment, I'll also show you the actual uh, you know, software, how to work with that. Uh, this is going to be during the uh, workshop part of this. Yep, so you might have the question, so what's the purpose of that? So uh, like I already kind of explained previously, so the purpose of GeoHammer is basically to give you a tool which you can use to quickly assess the data collected in the field. So this is intended so that people who are not geophysicists, so for example, drone pilots, so that they can understand whether the data they have gathered in the field, whether it is uh, like sufficient enough, whether it is um, okay, uh, and uh, whether they can leave the site. Otherwise, you know, you, what you might have is that the pilots go to the field, then they do the flights, and then they realize that, oh, actually, you know, once they come back to the office, that there's something wrong with the data, and they do need to go again. So this is kind of intended for people who don't really have any prior experience also working with GPR data to kind of give you a quick tool that you can very easily use uh, to analyze data coming from ground penetrating radars. And yeah, also what you can actually do is you can do some pre-processing on the data before you process it with, uh, sort of, so to say, full-blown uh, geo, uh, geophysical software such as Prism 2 or GPR Slice. Uh, because GeoHammer, it's basically made, uh, kind of, it's like tailor-made specifically for analyzing data from airborne surveys. Uh, because an airborne survey is essentially in the whole, the whole flight is going to be only one file. So you're going to need to have a way to be able to split the file into different segments. So you're going to have these survey lines separately. And then you can input these separate survey lines already in other uh, software such as Prism or GPR Slice. And you can do more in-depth processing of them. Uh, yeah, I think now I'll can tell you a bit about what are the main features of GeoHammer. And then after that, we'll go towards the installation and actually working with that. Uh, so currently GeoHammer is supported on both Windows and Mac OS operating systems. Uh, it does support SCGY files as well as GSSI uh, DZT file formats. Uh, what's uh, quite cool about it, especially after let's say moving to GeoHammer from software such as Prism, is that it does show you the map and it does show you the whole track because some other softwares don't really show you uh, where on the map you were located. So this kind of actually allows you to uh, put together the actual, the flight, which you did together with what's the, how is data looking like. Uh, like I already kind of explained previously as well, it does make a data splitting quite easy and you'll see that in a moment how you can do that exactly. And it uh, really has made the, the G, like at least the initial GPR data processing workflow a lot more easy. Uh, so through GeoHammer, you're also able to set marks in the data. So let's say if you see some anomaly that's there, you can simply place the mark. And then also when you export this data or when you export uh, these marks separately, then you'll, you're going to be able to see that. Um, so one other uh, cool feature which GeoHammer has is that there's a possibility to export all the marks 
two KML files. So this means, let's say you have some uh, profiles from the GPR and then you realize that there are some anomalies, you can mark them. And then what you can do afterwards is you can export all these marks to KML files, and then you can either open them up in uh, Google Earth, or you can open them up actually also in UGCS. And so, for example, uh, one, uh, one like interesting use case of this was also that recently we did fly uh, above this one field in Latvia. And uh, then we, what we first did, we did the photogrammetry mission. So we kind of made the map of the area. And then later on, we uh, also flew with the GPR and we processed the data. And we did see some anomalies uh, that were there and we weren't really sure what were they. But once we combined the map, the map from the photogram tree together with these marks from KML, once we imported both of them into GCS software, what we actually found was that uh, some of these anomalies were actually marks that were left there by this like agricultural machinery. And so this uh, also kind of gave us a lot more insight into maybe what anomalies should we look at and what anomalies should we kind of discard. Uh, so yeah, that's another cool feature. And also uh, I have to mention the amplitude map export as GeoTIFF images. Uh, so uh, you're going to be able to understand a bit more kind of how does that work exactly, but essentially if you have a bunch of anomalies at a certain level, then you can kind of make the amplitude map so that exactly at, uh, at these amplitudes in the data, uh, basically the, um, on the map, you're going to see highlights of where the anomalies are, and then you can basically export them as geotiff images. And then uh, again, you can either import them in some uh, more professional geotechnical software, or you can simply import them back into UGCS, maybe use them for your next flight planning. Uh, and the one kind of, uh, thing that we are kind of working on as well is data annotation for training neural networks. So uh, you can basically also mark, uh, basically if you mark certain regions in the data uh, where you know you have detected some targets, then later on actually you can train uh, neural networks with this so that this uh, whole uh, anomaly detection would be a bit more automated, but that's still kind of in development. So yeah, I, guess, I think that's quite a cool feature or quite a cool thing that we are working on. So um, yep. Yeah. And I think we can probably then move on a bit further and uh, I can, and can explain to you now how to install GeoHammer and how to work with the software interface. So the installation steps are as follows. So firstly, you need to download the latest build from our GitHub. I'll see if I can now maybe bring it up here on the screen. So just give me a moment. Let's see if we can now exit the full screen maybe. Yep. So here you can see this is the GitHub site open. Let me also make, maybe make that full screen so you can see it a bit, um, a bit larger. Uh, so yep, if you go to github.com slash UGCS slash UGCS Geohammer, or simply if you just Google um, Geohammer GitHub, you should be taken to the site. So this is where you can download it from. It also has a link to our industrial website where you can read more about uh, about GPRs. And yep, then also here is, there's kind of like an explanation on how to exactly set everything up. And there's also a wiki, which I'll kind of now follow one, when I'll basically show to you uh, how to work with the software itself. Uh, so you have to download the latest release of GeoHammer. You simply need to go to this site over here. You can see the releases are over here. And currently the newest one is 1.0.7. And then simply download this zip archive. And then inside the archive, you're gonna have the GeoHammer files, which you can then open to run it. As it's already mentioned here, you do need to have uh, Java 8 installed. So if something maybe isn't really working, then you can make sure that Java is installed so you can do so from this link. If for some reason, maybe it doesn't really work, then you can simply drop us an email to support at ugcs.com. And then we can basically try to uh, help you solve these problems and try to help you get uh, GeoHammer running. Yeah, I think let's move back here to our presentation. So yeah, basically, uh, I just kind of want to cover again these steps. So firstly, you just download the latest build, uh, 1.0.7 in this case, extract all the files, then you need to ensure that Java 8 is installed, and then you simply start the app. Uh, so, okay, I think now we can probably move into the data processing workshop and I can actually show you how to work with that. Uh, so I think we're gonna look at uh, two to three data sets, depending on how much time will we have. So the first data set will be a flight over gas pipelines, uh, with uh, the uh, 500 megahertz antenna. The second data set uh, will be actually the data set from Greenland where we found the lost uh, World War II aircraft. 
And then the third one uh, is a bathymetry uh, example. So, yep, I think let's get into it. So maybe let me take the presentation away here for a bit. So here you can see, this is what's gonna be inside the folder of GeoHammer. So uh, for me, I can simply run the jar file and then you can see I have GeoHammer open right here. So to open the files, you can simply kind of drag and drop the files in GeoHammer. So let's now do that. Now let me go to the GPR data folder. And so here I have the gas pipes. So I think let's use this one. So this is the file that we're gonna be looking at right now. So all you have to do is kind of take the file, simply drag it here into GeoHammer. And now I can see that it opens up. Let me make it full screen. Hopefully, hopefully you can see everything well enough. Uh, so I think at first I'll maybe explain the interface a bit to you and then we can uh, get to working with it. So as you can see here on the left side, you can see the map together with the a trace from the drone. So most likely the takeoff point was somewhere over here. Then these are the survey lines and then the drone simply went back to the initial location. Then of course over here, you can actually see the uh, GPR data itself. You can also see the flags or the marks. So normally uh, what we can have implemented is that at, at each waypoint that the drone visits, it does put a flag. So initially, once you open this up, you're gonna see that these flags from these waypoints are here. These are intended so that when you open this up with some other software such as Prism, then you have some way of also splitting all the data files. Then of course here, what you can see, you have also the save buttons. You have buttons for background removal. Uh, then here, uh, I'll, I'll, sh I'll get to this in a moment. So I'll just kind of show you how you can actually split all the survey lines. And yeah, then over here, basically you have uh, ways how you can manipulate with the data itself, you know, zoom in, zoom out and jump through different uh, sets. So the very first thing, uh, what you can do once you open everything up is that you can actually split everything by uh, survey lines. So if, for example, you see that uh, where we have our data currently, this is only one folder of the data. So not fo one folder, one file of the data. So what I can actually do, uh, I can later on save it here, but for now, I will think I'll just create some new folder where I'll later on, I'll just save all the processed data. So to actually split it in survey lines, you need to go here, see so select, and then just click on it. And then you can see that you're basically this kind of rectangle is gonna appear. And then you can simply take these corners of the rectangle and you can drag them so that only the survey lines which you're interested in analyzing, so that only they will remain. Basically everything that's gonna be outside the rectangle, that's gonna be ignored and kind of cut away. So you can kind of zoom in, make sure that everything's fine. And okay, so this is actually looking quite good. Uh, so then uh, once you are kind of happy with uh, your chosen selection, then you can go here to crop. And you can see after you click on it, then these lines now have disappeared. These lines at the end, they have also disappeared. And now we're left with only the survey lines, which we are now interested in. So now the next step, what you can do is you can see we still have some flags left here. So to remove the flags, you can go here where you have the trash bin icon, and then it's gonna basically remove all the additional elements. So now what we can do, we can actually zoom into the data. If you hold the control button and zoom, you can see that it kind of also, it can basically make these data sets a bit wider. And if you can zoom without control, then you can simply zoom in there. So up here, you also see these arrows and this kind of uh, mark with centering on it. You can see as I'm clicking the arrows, basically I'm moving through different data sets. So currently the second one is selected, or it's not data sets, but I guess uh, profiles would be the more correct term. And if you want to uh, kind of make it, uh, so to say full screen, or basically to make it fit the current window, you can simply click here, and then you know this makes things a lot more easy. And so now you can see that once uh, I'm on this side, on the left side, and I'm clicking the button, nothing more is happening then I'm already at this data set. So yeah, I think um, then the next step, what you can do is you can actually do background removal on the data. So to do that, you can simply click here on this button that says background removal, 
And you can now see that uh, the lines which you had here are now gone. And so now data is already looking a lot better. So then normally uh, when you're doing GPR data processing, you're also adjusting for the contrast in it. So uh, let's maybe find some example where, let's maybe try to analyze this file. So then uh, normally in some other software, this is called the gain function. Uh, but yeah, anyways, you can see as I'm moving the contrast here, then you know you can increase it or decrease it. If you open this file up in, for example, Prism software, then most likely initially the file is gonna be looking something like this. So I think GeoHammer by default already does kind of uh, increase it a bit. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, you can, would you, at least what I'm normally doing is I'm adjusting it so that at least for me, uh, the visibility of the, uh, of the anomalies is the best. So this is kind of subjective to what feels best for you. So I think I'm gonna leave it to about like 50 where it was, it seems to be the best in this case. And yeah, so let's now move to the very first uh, profile. And so now what you can actually do is you can simply double click anywhere. And you can see that this mark has now appeared. So then once you have this mark over here, over this anomaly, then you can simply click here on the flag icon and you can see that now a flag has been placed there and you can see the flag here on the map as well. If you want to move it around, you can do so. If you want to maybe make it a bit more exact, you can uh, hold the control button and scroll and then you can also adjust the location of the flag. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through all the, um, basically all the survey lines and I'm going to put the, uh, the flags at places where we have the anomalies. So it's kind of the normal process that we're going through. It does take a bit of time, but you know, you, you, kind of, <laughs> you do get used to that. Yeah, so you, you, have, you have kind of quite a bit of questions there. So like I said already earlier, once you have some questions, then just leave them in the Q&A section and then either my colleagues will answer them or at the end of the webinar, I can basically try to do this like live Q&A session where I can answer your questions. So essentially in this place, uh, what we have is that uh, all through the area, there's basically two pipelines going through. So these are uh, natural gas pipelines. We, so we, we're kind of working with the company uh, that owns them uh, or basically services the grid uh, to, and they allowed us to fly over them. And so the, their diameter, if I'm not mistaken, is approximately 70 centimeters. So I think we are almost at the last survey line. So let's just do a few and then we should be done with this. So yeah, I think now this, this is it. And uh, now you can see if we zoom out, then I you know over uh, all these anomalies, you can see I have now placed the flag. So the flags are also now visible here on the map. And so now there's a few more things which we can do. So I think the very first thing is that now kind of once you have gone through the analysis of uh, and once you have split these survey lines, what I can do now is I can click here to basically save all of them. So now I can simply open up the folder, the processed folder, and just save them in there. And this will basically uh, make it so that later on I can, you know, if I want to open up these files with some more professional geotechnical software, then I can easily do that since I already have all of them split into these survey lines. Um, one more thing is that here, uh, one thing I mentioned is that you can actually set uh, this, uh, essentially this kind of a, a map of these anomalies so that you can see as I'm moving these arrows here, then like the highlighted regions basically change. So ideally what you want is you want to take the top arrow and move it somewhere over here. And then if necessary, you can also adjust the uh, bottom arrow so that you can kind of tell the software where should the bottom region be. And once you feel that you have adjusted this quite well, then uh, you can actually uh, export this as a GeoTIFF file. I think before that, I'll show you how you can export this as a KML and how you can open it up with uh, Google Earth. 
So to do so, you can simply click here on KML. And then now it already kind of offer you to basically save the file as a uh, KML file. So now I'll simply save it on our desktop. And now if I just double click on this file, this will open it up for me in Google Earth. Hopefully the screen um, resolution isn't too large for you. So you can now see that this is the location where the uh, lines are. And if I now just zoom in on that, so now I can see the place marks that I have placed. Uh, for th those of you who are using GCS mission planning software, I can also show how you can basically import the place marks in there. So let me just launch it real quick. Okay, so you can see here we have the GCS map right now. So if I now go to map options and map layers, then you can see I can either choose to import 2D objects or place marks. I think in this case, it should be considered as a place mark. So let's select place marks and let's click on add to add a new source. So we can, for example, name it Geohammer1. Let's create this. And then you can simply select the source and click on upload. So now uh, let's go to our desktop. As so this is the file where I have my place marks, let's select it. You can see currently the place marks are being imported. And once they're done, I'm taken to the location where they are. Uh, but uh, I'll, I do need to kind of uh, switch this to enabled. So once this is here, I think it's it also, I'm now seeing all the place marks here in UGCS. So you can already kind of see from the place marks where they are, but basically, well, obviously we now, in this case, we do know that there are these pipelines going through, but even if we did not, then it would be quite obvious to, at least to me, that uh, there should be some kind of a longer, um, longer objects underneath the ground. Uh, you can tell their exact, exact depth in some other software. So with Geohammer, you can't really do that, at least for now. Uh, but yeah, uh, this would indicate that there obviously is something underneath there. And one more thing you can do with Geohammer is that actually also you can export this, uh, so say this uh, kind of highlight map as a GeoTIF file. So to do so, uh, one kind of a trick that uh, we're normally doing is that you actually increase the radius of these highlights. And by the way, uh, if you some, for some reason want to disable them uh, for now, then you can click here on this like flashlight icon. And yep, then what you can do here uh, on this gain tab, you can simply increase the radius. I'd actually recommend that you set the radius to maximum uh, if you want to export it. And then you can simply click here on, uh, on GeoTIFF. And then again, you can simply save it on your desktop. So now let's take a look here. And so you can see we have our uh, TIFF file and this file can actually also be imported into GCS. And to do so, we can simply go here to map and then we can add a new source. Let's again call this Geohammer. Let's click on upload and then let's select this TIFF file. And then we can simply move it here as an overlay. And then you can see there's currently this, still this like black square around it. Uh, but yeah, anyways, you can see that now the, these place marks do match up with uh, these highlights. So it's kind of the same as, um, as you saw it in Geohammer. Then if, for example, you want to hide the place marks, you can go here and simply hide them. And of course you can do the same uh, with uh, this with my kind of highlight map. And yes, yeah, so like I said earlier, what you can actually do is if you also fly a photogrammetry mission of this area, uh, then uh, you can basically compare the photogrammetry with these place marks. And then this might be able to tell you if maybe in some cases, these targets might be targets from above the ground or are these anomalies indeed from somewhere underneath the surface. 
So yeah, I think this was it regarding this data set. And I think probably now we can open another data set, which would be a data set from Greenland in 2018. So I think let's uh, make this window a bit smaller for now. Then let's take a look where I have my data. Yeah, so the Greenland P38 search. Um, and let's see, let's, I think let's take this one. So uh, over here already what I'm going to do is I'm going to import all of these files now together. So in GeoHammer also you can actually either import whole folders or you can import multiple files simultaneously. Now let's make this slightly smaller. And yeah, so here you can see, uh, of course, uh, you, you can kind of see the map, but because you know it's Greenland and it's, it's just going to be uh, white snow over there. So I'm not going to be able to tell too much from the map itself. So we now decrease the radius slightly. Let's make it somehow like so. Or probably actually for now, let's maybe just turn this off. Uh, so yeah, here you can see, uh, even though it might seem like there are not that many survey lines, this is actually from uh, three flights that we did. Uh, so in, in this location, actually, when, uh, when my colleagues arrived there, uh, it was kind of more or less known where the airplane was, but keep in mind still, it was left there during the World War II. And so uh, there was like a team that was using a ground-based GPR and a team that was using uh, the drone-based GPR, or uh, these were us, of course. Uh, so, yep, yeah, in the very first flight, actually, on the very su first survey line, we did manage to actually locate the aircraft. And now you're also, also going to be able to kind of tell how, how would you actually find it uh, initially. So, uh, here we have our file again. So, the very first thing to do is you do background removal. So, even if, yeah, so non-background actually should be removed. In some cases, it might not be that obvious that it is. And yep, then you can kind of play around with the contrast. So maybe now it's a bit too much. But actually now you can see that as you're kind of playing around with it, that there seems to be something here at this, at this depth. And so keep in mind, this is basically just ice and snow. Uh, so let's see, yeah. Uh, you can see that if, as we're kind of moving through the data, this anomaly seems to be there actually in these first two flights. And in the last two, it's no longer there. So I'm just assuming that maybe they can try to determine at least where would the target be and like how far would it go. So uh, we can now do the same thing as we did in the previous data set. Let me just increase the contrast maybe just a bit. So again, we can simply zoom in on the anomaly. We can kind of try to pinpoint it. So let's place a flag in this location. Let's place a flag over here. So you can already kind of see there's going to be a pattern that basically on, on all of these survey lines, the anomaly is going to be there. And now let's do this flight as well. And actually it seems that on the very first line, this is the line uh, where the drone was simply approaching the first waypoint. So still on that line did somehow manage to also detect the aircraft. And on these files actually it seems that there is no longer anything there. So yeah, you can see kind of we do have a cluster of these anomalies. We just look at it somewhere over there. Um, and yeah, I think, so this is kind of how they found out that, okay, there might be something in there. And then actually once they discovered this, then they had the ground GPR team, which kind of, uh, you know, did the, uh, well, kind of scanned the area as well. And they also detected that there is something indeed there. Uh, and so then they had the task that they basically had to pinpoint where is this anomaly exactly? Uh, Cause you know, still the accuracy isn't in, uh, in centimeters in these cases. Uh, so. Uh, what we can do now is, of course, if you want, you can again export this to KML, and then you can also preview that in Google Earth or in UGCS. But then now, let's maybe take a look at the next flights that they did. 
So I think it should be this folder, yeah. Let's take a look at these. So you can simply drag and drop them over there. I think let's do the following way. Let's take actually the ones from this folder. Let's extract this folder as well, and then we can basically combine them. So if I'm not mistaken, then there should be kind of a cross grid of them. Let's try to do it like so. Yep. Uh, so let's take these, let's put them in this folder, and then let's basically analyze all of them together. So now again, we can do background removal. You can see these condensates that were kind of more uh, blackish. Now that they're again, they're kind of looking all the same after we did the background removal. And yeah, now it's simply the task of uh, kind of finding where where do we have the airplane. So for doing so, let's let me expand these data sets a bit. And yeah, then we can simply kind of zoom in on the anomalies and we can place the flags, same as we did before. To try to pinpoint the uh, the center of the aircraft. So this flag is a bit offset, so let me just correct that. So you want to see, I'm getting a bit of a cluster of points over there. So the aircraft itself, it's actually uh, what they found. It's a Lockheed Martin uh, fighter plane. It's a P-38, if I'm not mistaken. So now hopefully uh, there is going to be an expedition to actually uh, get the plane out from there. There's actually a similar plane, I think the same model, that they, they get, did actually uh, dig up in the, uh, I think it was in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. And they did bring this plane up and uh, restore it back to flying condition. So let's hope that the same uh, destiny awaits this plane as well. So these are from those survey lines. And I think now let's see, um, I think this should be, let's put the flag over here, try to move it. Yes, these are those survey lines. So that are already in perpendicular. So now let's try to place the flag somewhere over there. And what's what's I, I suppose what's kind of interesting is that if you if you place these marks and actually it does kind of uh, start to resemble an airplane, uh, even even though I know oh, obviously it's probably simply a coincidence because of how the grid is placed, um, but still. It's not always that you get to see kind of uh, what you're looking for exactly in the data like that. So this actually seems to be quite a strong anomaly over here. So at least uh, doing this method, this allows you to basically understand where might be the center of it and where might it be necessary to actually perform the, uh, the drillings in this case. Either doing the drilling or the digging because uh, one limitation of GPRs in general is that you might be able to tell whether the anomaly is from the surface or from subsurface, but you might not be able to tell what it is exactly until you do the digging and once you do the hard work and then you can only find out what is it exactly. Uh, yep, so uh, this is kind of how you can try to pinpoint where it is and then basically you can take the basically the points that are uh, in the biggest cluster, it seems over here or over here. And yeah, then you can simply try to, you know, find find it exactly. Uh, yeah, again, uh, if we now enable the, uh, the anomaly heat map, um, let's maybe move it a bit like so. And also let's turn it on over here. Yeah, so you actually also see that uh, this is kind of where, and even if maybe we haven't placed a mark at some point, then still by uh, doing this method, 
you're able to kind of pinpoint where is uh, like the biggest hotspot in this case. Yeah, so this is the second example, which I want to show you uh, regarding data processing. And uh, yep, so actually what's, uh, oh, but also suppose one, one more thing, which, uh, which you can, can do is you can do the same as you did before. So you can also uh, kind of crop away all the unnecessary parts. So you can use the select tool and, you know, then just kind of analyze only the survey lines you want to take a look at. Uh, but yeah, I think now probably uh, let's skip this a bit and now since we're already kind of approaching the end, I think I can well, I want to show you one last data set and then we can move on to the Q&A section. Uh, so uh, let me try to find where it is. So uh, this is uh, one we did a flight over a lake in Denmark, uh, the Silkeborg Lake. So uh, let's maybe try to open both of these files up. As here you can see, this is the lake. In question, uh, in these cases, since this is kind of a bit more, um, so, so say un unusual, um, unusual shape, then maybe using the select tool might not be as optimal because it might be a bit harder to actually split these lines. I can attempt to do so anyways, but ideally you, you would probably need to perform splitting using a different method, but uh, still let's, let's try to do that. We might lose some data, especially in the bathymetry case. It's quite important to basically get the uh, depth measurements of the lake from every single point. And I can also actually probably also tell you that so this uh, whole flight that was done with the Cobra SE150 antenna, and uh, it uh, did see you know the the lake bed in this case. And actually, then from from this data, uh, they did reconstruct kind of it in a 3D model. I think it was done using GPR slice if I'm not mistaken. So, yep, I think this should be good. Let's see, what's the result of, uh, once it cuts away the unnecessary parts. Well, there's one survey line at the end there, but okay, let's, I think let's try to do it like so, so we can simply crop it away. And well, now it's looking, it's looking a bit better. There are still like some places where, uh, let's say there's this line over here. And then if you realize there's these kind of small parts, then you can actually simply uh, take them away because you can see there's also these like, uh, you know, this is also the ability to close the unnecessary profiles. So let's maybe do it somehow like so. And then yep, I think let's first maybe I'll remove all the flags because in this case, all the flags aren't really going to be necessary anyways for us. Yeah, so you can see, for example, this is a very small part. So probably this one we can take away. And there's the two lines where the drone was actually approaching the uh, the survey line. So I think these are simply lines. So probably somewhere towards the end, we're going to have these uh, smaller bits. So in these cases, what I would probably normally do is I would actually try to split uh, this data set using, for example, maybe Prism software. I think in that case, it would make it a bit easier to do so. This and can probably close. But yeah, anyways, I hope you get the uh, the general idea. And so now, what I can also show you is that you can you know do the same process as before. So you can quickly do background removal, and you can already kind of see uh, what appears to be the lake bed in this case. Now, if we do bring the contrast up a bit, then you can see it even better. So uh, you know, uh, it can also be used in these cases. So you can simply, after you do the flights, you can simply confirm whether the data is good enough, whether it is reliable enough, that you can come back to the office and maybe give the data to some uh, you know, geophysicist or some GPR specialist who can then analyze this data. And yeah, I think then probably regarding data processing part, that's it. So if we now go back to our presentation here, um, yeah, so I see one question from Eras is, so you have a list or a table of current GPR models which are compatible with the M600 Pro as well as UGCS. Uh, actually, yes, we do have such a list. Uh, let me see if I, so basically we're mainly working currently with two radar manufacturers. So one of them is uh, Radsys from Latvia. Uh, so we're kind of quite closely co uh, cooperating with them. And there's also a radar team from Sweden. 
So here, for example, you can see a table of uh, the current antennas, which we do support. Uh, but actually there is a bit more now, because for example, RAD says they're working on some um, lower frequency antennas as well. Yeah, so currently you can see the, there are four antennas in this table uh, from RADSYS. There's the Zond 1000 as well as the Zond 500 antenna. So you can also see the current penetration depths. So for Zond 1000, it can, it's about like one to two meters. So you can use these to maybe search for some utilities or some small artifacts. Uh, and Zond 500, it's, it has a higher, like it has a higher penetration depth uh, from the surface as well as from the drone. And so it can be, it's a bit more of a universal tool, uh, if I may say it like so. And of course here you can also see what's the minimum size of these detectable objects. And you can actually see that there's um, this kind of, uh, like an in inverse correlation. So the lower the center frequency, the, high, the larger has to be the smallest object which you are able to detect using a GPR. So yeah, these two are the main RASIS antennas which we're using, and then there's also the Radar Team Cobra antennas which are uh, normally a bit lower frequency and so with these you can detect maybe some smaller targets for example with the bathymetry also we did use the cobra sc150 uh, when we did detect the plane in greenland we used the cobra se70 antenna and uh, yeah so i guess for whatever application you want to use gpr4 then you first need to understand uh, you know uh, which antenna would be best in your case and whether that antenna actually can be mounted on the drone but in most cases, the answer is yes. And so you can use um, either one of the more kind of universal antennas, such as the Zon 500, or you can actually uh, have multiple GPR antennas and then simply change them depending on what application uh, you want to use it for. So I hope that answers your question. We'll see if there are any other uh, questions currently. So if you do have them, you can currently put them in the Q&A section because we're still in the uh, Q&A uh, section of this webinar. And like I mentioned, the webinar, it will be published uh, afterwards so you can kind of replay it. And if you will have some questions or maybe you're interested in, let's say the GPR system, uh, so the Skyhub computer to go, together with the altimeter, then you can simply contact us uh, and co our contact details will also be at the end or you can simply go to our website, which is industrial.gcs.com. I can, uh, well, maybe I'm waiting a bit for maybe if there's some like last questions here, I can maybe show this to you. So yeah, if you just go to this website, uh, industrial.ugcs.com, then here you can see there's gonna be different samples as well. You can see what sensors we're currently working with. So there's also the echo sounder, sensor, magnetometer, methane detector. So yeah, you know, you can read about it. You can also visit our YouTube channel and see our videos where we also explain kind of how this technology works. And if you're interested maybe in getting the system yourself, then you can simply drop us a message through here and then, you know, we can talk further. further. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a question from what post-processing GPR software do you recommend? Uh, so yeah, like I said, the um, GeoHammer can be used kind of for initial data processing, but then for further processing, you can use something else. So one such example of the software would actually be the Prism software. Uh, let me maybe uh, also quickly show that to you. So it's called the Prism 2. Uh, Prism 2 is actually developed by the same company who's making the RADSYS radars. So uh, yeah, by uh, radar systems. And yeah, uh, I can actually, maybe I can quickly just show you how just the file looks like when you open it up. Oh, uh, and while I'm doing that, I see there's another question about, so what's the maximum depth you can achieve with a GPR in the bathymetry? Uh, so it does, um, it does actually depend a bit on you know, what altitude you're flying at, what's the salinity of the water. Uh, there was one uh, interesting example where actually we flew over a lake in, uh, in I think it was in Sweden, uh, Sweden or Norway, somewhere there. And then basically uh, the flight actually was done not quite close to the water, it was done about uh, like 20 meter altitude. And from this altitude, we could still see the depth, like the bottom of the lake, uh, which uh, I'm not really sure how deep the lake was in, in that case. But I think uh, for all antennas, you can also kind of see what's the maximum depth how far can they see? But I think uh, at least like five to 10 meters uh, should be okay for most radars for uh, bathymetry. So I'll see where we have our GPR data. Let's quickly open up uh, one of these files. Let's actually do one, do one of the processed ones here. 
so this is kind of how it looks like in Prism, you know, and uh, this is the software that we are uh, normally uh, using. Let's so maybe do it this way. Yes, yeah, so this is kind of how it would look like over here. Um, yeah, so there's another question about can it detect personal mines at 15 centimeter depth? Uh, actually, this is quite a good question as well. We have uh, experimented with this. So uh, mine detection with the GPR is possible, but it does depend on the mines themselves. So with some, with some newer landmines, it might be a bit harder to find them uh, if they're only made from plastic and if they're very small. Maybe even if there's like clay you know, placed on the side and actually like in the middle of the road, there's only the switch, it might be a bit harder to detect them. However, uh, with some older landmines, uh, so, uh, you know, metallic ones, uh, especially, uh, then it's actually, it's, it can be a lot more easier to detect them. So we have actually made our own polygon for landmine detection. And so in this polygon, we did place these targets, which are kind of resembling landmines. So they're basically in the diameter from 15 to 30 centimeters, also buried at a depth of about 15 to, 15 to 30 centimeters. And, um, if I may actually quickly show you one other um, data set from here, if I have them, and then I can also can demonstrate that uh, you are able to detect landmines as well. So let's go here. I think it should be here under small targets. Uh, and yeah, I think this, these are the files we're interested in. Yeah, so here you can see on the map, this is our test polygon, which we have made. And already here, well, the flags are, flags are already placed, but you know, we can still uh, do the uh, analysis on them. Let's do the background removal. Let's bring this down a bit. I think probably some parts of this data have, might have been already cut away, uh, but uh, let's see, maybe if we expand it like so. Oh yeah, so here you can actually see where the flags have been placed. So all these targets, these are essentially uh, what would resemble a landmine. So like I said, 15 to 30 centimeters, uh, both plastic and metallic targets. Detecting uh, plastic might be a bit hard for the GPR in some cases. Uh, so detecting metal is a bit easier, but still, you know, depending on the surface area, it can be done. Oh yeah, so uh, Matt, uh, if you were kind of disconnected for a moment, then yeah, so regarding your question about the bedrock and so detecting it with the GPR, is, that does depend on what antenna you're using because they also have different penetration depths. Uh, but if you're using, let's say, one of the lower frequency antennas, then I think doing, let's say, uh, 10 meters uh, to see the bedrock, I think that shouldn't really be a problem. I can quickly actually try to bring up the, um, the radar team uh, documentation. If I can now find it and uh, yeah, because on, on their website, they also do have uh, the comparison between different antennas which they are using. Christoph, please show the yeah. same compa comparison table of GPR antennas. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, thank you. Maximum penetration from surface and from drone. <clears throat> yeah, this, yes. Yep. So over here, you can also actually see that. So um, how basically you can take the uh, penetration depth from the surface and then keep in mind that then the penetration depth from the drone would be about uh, two times less than that. So th these are the uh, radar team Cobra radars. And then basically you can see uh, here, they also can comparing how deep can you see in different mediums. So it, it, like I said, it does depend on the antenna. Um, so this seems to be the So the plug-in GPR, I think at the end, they also had the comparison between like these three models. Yeah, so for example, here you can see they have the SC40, SC70, and SC150. So you can see what's their vertical and horizontal resolution, what's their weight, um, but I think regarding the penetration depth in water, I'd, I'd say you can get probably up to about 20 uh, meters in, in depth. Yeah, yeah numbers, <laughs> numbers in our table are from practical experience, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, okay, let's see. Um, it seems to me that maybe there aren't really any new questions currently. Uh, so, yep, I uh, think then probably for now, for this webinar, uh, that's it. So I just want to say thank, thank you to everybody who joined. 
Uh, I hope it was interesting uh, for you. So yeah, this webinar will be published on our YouTube channel as well as on industrial.gcs.com. Uh, so yeah, if you maybe missed some parts or you know weren't able to fully see it, then you can you know look at this again at a later time. But yeah, I think for now, then I'll just say thank you.